Hi everyone, it's Jessica here from Wondrous Beauty and today I've got the opportunity to learn from the amazing Tabitha McIntosh who is a naturopath and clinical nutritionist from Awaken Your Health here in Woolara in Sydney. Thank you for your time today. I'm really happy to have you in here with me. Thanks Jess. You're welcome. So today what we really wanted to learn about was mm. hormone disruption because mm. we hear about it a lot mm. but I think it's really quite misunderstood as to sure. the reality of it. Yes. Yeah, sure. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit more about you and how you came to do naturopathy sure. and nutrition? I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> but um, look, I've always been incredibly in awe of the body and um, its mechanisms and the fact that you know every system communicates and we're really very sophisticatedly put together. Mm. And um, I've always been drawn to the body and that took me straight from school to high school studying a medical science degree. And at the end of that degree, I was in a position where I could literally go on and do graduate medicine or do something that made my heart sing just a little bit more. Mm. And uh, to support myself through the medical science degree, I had been working as a receptionist at a doctor's surgery with five really uh, busy, fantastic doctors. But I had great insight into what their everyday was like mm. and perhaps even into some of the frustration that they felt mm. and I could certainly see clearly what their toolbox was, mm. what they had in their toolbox to be able to offer support to uh, their patients uh, complaints mm. and I knew that there was more. Mm. So I chose instead to do postgraduate research in nutritional and environmental medicine mm. and then I went on also having met a naturopath myself for mm -hmm. some of my own health uh, concerns mm. or complaints and curiosities. Mm. Uh, really inspired by a fabulous naturopath, I went on to study naturopathy. Now, uh, lucky me, I got lots of exemptions having done the medical science degree, right. yeah. but I found I had so much more to work with mm. as studying the nutritional biochemistry, understanding how we weren't just um, uh, subject to our genes, our inherited genes. Mm. There was so much we could do with the way that we chose to live, with our lifestyle, with our environmental exposures and with how we bolstered ourselves nutritionally and supported our nutritional developmental needs that I just felt like I'd found my calling. Mm. Really? Great. And so how long have you been practicing for now? I have been saying I've been in practice for 11 years for a few years now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, I'm, I'd be 12 or 13 years in practice. I graduated from the degree in 2000 mm -hmm. and then the naturopathy took me another four years. Mm -hmm. um, throughout that process, you know, I've been, it's actually quite unusual for a naturopath to have been in full-time clinical practice for that long. Mm -hmm. But um, I've had my own experiences having my children who are now 10 and 12 and they've absolutely added value to me as a clinician. I think the more life experience you have and um, and also the more clients that you interact with. I've learned so much from the clients that I've worked with over the last 12 or so years. So mm. yeah, coming on, coming on 13 years, I'd say. So today it's all about hormones. Mm. So what are our hormones and what role do they play in our day-to-day -day life? Hormones play like a pivotal and critical role in not just day-to-day -day life but also very importantly in our development. Mm -hmm. So hormones are um, chemical messengers, mm -hmm. they speak, uh, our endocrine system again is like a symphony orchestra so we have some master glands in our brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary and they speak to our thyroid, they speak to our adrenal glands, they speak to our gonads, mm -hmm. ovaries, testes etc. None of those axes or, or systems work in isolation. They all work um, in communication with each other and not only are our hormones critical for our day-to-day -day functioning and our mood, even they contribute to our neurotransmitter production, to our energy, to you know how happy we feel in the world, mm. but they also impact things like our menstrual cycle if we're a lady, mm -hmm. our libido for either gender, our skin, mm. our, our immune capacity, and uh, I would say that hormones are 
never more important than throughout development. So getting the hormonal cascade right and having as minimal interference from the external world as possible um, when a woman is trying to conceive, a couple is mm. trying to conceive uh, throughout gestation, throughout pregnancy, postpartum, and in those early years for a young infant, mm. um, the hormonal uh, balance is never more critical to get right. Mm. Amazing. Mm. So the hormones are really quite critical for all of us. Like they mm. it sounds like they're connected to so many different things in our body. They really. are. There are other messengers in the body as yeah. well, like our neurotransmitters and our immune system and our immune cells. But uh, yes, the hormones are literally tied in with everything, every other body system, mm. even with our digestion. Obviously, you know, we've all had to, you know, in preparing for a race, had to go and have a nervous pee or a nervous poo or something mm, like that. You know, yeah. our stress hormones definitely affect our um, our digestive tract and our digestive functions. So, yeah. you know, and we all respond to our stress hormones differently. You mm. know, you may have dry mouth, lose appetite when stressed, or some people stress eat. So yes, they're they're literally involved with our every experience. Mm. Mm. So then, what is hormone disruption? Mm. Lots of things can disrupt mm. the hormonal cascade and you know having a, a really high stress load mm. is one of those things. But when we're talking about environment, yes our, our lifestyle and allostatic load or our stress is very much a part of our environment. But I think for the purpose of our chat mm. I'll talk about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Mm -hmm. and. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, you know, we could even use the contraceptive pill mm -hmm. as an, an example, yeah. but really I'll talk about those things uh, that are in our environment that people might not be so aware of. Mm. So for the most part, endocrine disrupting chemicals have a tendency to mimic estrogen-like hormones mm -hmm. and to block androgen or male like hormones mm -hmm. and that's I'm generalizing there mm -hmm. that basic description would cover a large majority of how endocrine disrupting chemicals work so endocrine disrupting chemicals uh, work in a myriad of ways because they can mimic our own endogenous hormones so pretend to be they can pretend Look to be exactly the same as they can sort voice. of like a key they mm. can fit into a lock mm. they might not turn it mm. but they can fit in and uh, confuse the body confuse, yeah. so they can mimic they can block the transport mm. of hormones mm -hmm. so the so message doesn't get through that's no exactly right yeah. and so um, one thing I didn't mention is that there are quite a number of endocrine disrupting chemicals that block iodine uptake to the mm. thyroid or block the production of thyroid hormones mm. and they can work to derail endogenous hormone breakdown as well so there's just a myriad of symptoms mm. and a myriad of ways that some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals can disturb uh, our healthy balance mm. Mm. and how what are some of the symptoms or ways that we would notice within mm. ourselves that the hormones are out of whack I'll start with men. Mm -hmm. The majority of my clientele, over 70%, I think, would be um, female. Mm. But I don't want us to forget the men. Of course. Our not. men matter. Yes. And if I'm talking uh, developing men, teens, mm. or grown men, they may experience endocrine disruption symptoms with uh, quite severe acne, mm. changes to their mood, compromise to their immune function, so getting sick all the time, mm. um, perhaps even in signs of insulin resistance fatigue, mm -hmm. but definitely also lack of libido yeah. or changes to sexual performance and things like that. Yeah. Um, if I now backtrack on the timeline of life mm. and talk about our little boys, mm -hmm. very, very sadly, high exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals for a mum mm. who's pregnant with a baby boy, mm -hmm. certainly we can see uh, changes to the structure of the genitourinary system. So we can see congenital um, malformations in our baby boys, mm -hmm. things like undescended testes or hypospadias. Mm -hmm. And um, there's actually a measure used in the clinical literature. Uh, it's a measure of anogenital distance mm -hmm. and it's used as a marker of exposure to things like phthalates during pregnancy. Wow. So we see changes to the structure of a baby boy's um, genitourinary system. So we're now literally measuring oh, yes. how much hormone disruption has happened oh, yes. from the environment. Oh, I know that that term endocrine disrupting chemicals gets 
bandied mm -hmm. around, but anyone who's got a science like sort of questioning clinical, uh, critical thinking like mind, a little bit of a dig in the clinical literature and there is so much data out there. So we're not just talking about anogenital distance, we're mm -hmm. talking about presentations like hypospadias, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a congenital disorder in baby boys where the opening of the urethra, mm. which should obviously be at the tip of the penis, mm. turns up somewhere else along the shaft of the penis. Wow. It's not the sort of thing you come and see a naturopath for necessarily, oh. but I've had a number of clients who needed to put their newborn babies um, under surgery to correct mm. hypospadias. Mm. Um, conditions or presentations like hypospadias having increased tenfold in the last 10 years. Wow. And there's data to back this up. Mm. This isn't sort of our opinion. Mm, that's so amazing. yes, lots of measures in the yeah. literature. Yeah. We're measuring it, but like, what are we then doing about it oh, in terms well, of the cause? We'll get to that later, yeah. <laughs> but it's not just about policy. Yeah. Sometimes people feel helpless mm. waiting for policy change, but really the change has to happen at the grassroots. Mm. Yeah. So you took us through for the men and those yep. symptoms every day. What about for yeah. the girls? One thing I notice with the you know large volume of female clients that I work with mm -hmm. could be any age, mm -hmm. could be could be young girls, mm -hmm. um, perhaps early menarche, mm -hmm. so periods coming earlier and earlier. Yep. Uh, the earliest uh, menstrual cycle I've ever experienced with a with a patient here is eight years of age. Um, and obviously you're not quite emotionally ready no. for that and there can be a number of reasons mm -hmm. for that, not just chemical exposure and to make it even more confusing, sometimes that chemical exposure that's contributed to something like that has actually happened while that baby mm. girl's been in utero. Mm. Not necessarily something she's doing at the minute, mm. but obviously can be. Early menarche, uh, heavier periods, mm -hmm. um, because when we're exposed to prolific uh, estrogen mimicking chemicals that can work to increase our endometrial lining and make it thicker mm. and give us more, more clots and, mm. and more premenstrual symptoms, uh, more tender breasts. Probably the thing I notice most in clinic with my female patients is thyroid disruption. Right. And unfortunately, a lot of these endocrine disrupting chemicals that disturb the HPT axis, mm -hmm. the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis, some of those chemicals don't actually change the pituitary hormone of TSH, mm -hmm. and that's the main hormone that's measured in blood tests. Okay. Unless you've got a really... So it won't get picked up. In won't necessarily mm. get picked up. Mm. Uh, uh, really good GPs, and there are lots of them out mm. there, who are thinking a little bit outside the box, will tend to test a T4 mm. as well, and that's mm. actually produced at the thyroid. And we do see changes with T4 and T3 mm. with our endocrine disrupting uh, chemical exposures. But what I notice with these women is that they're just not feeling quite as energetic mm -hmm. as they'd like to. Uh, maybe their bowels have slowed down, maybe they've experienced some weight gain, mm. a little bit of hair loss, mm -hmm. uh, a bit of a flattening of mood. Mm. And I can guarantee that nine out of 10 of the women that will present to me like that in a week, they haven't considered the fact that their lifestyle or their personal care products or the smelly candle that they burn every night or the perfume that they spray twice a day could potentially be impacting those symptoms. So I see in clinic a really big disconnect mm. between daily habits mm. and health. Mm. We all know that we are what we eat and what we eat is really critical to our health outcomes. Mm. We know that we also um, have the, uh, some input via our genetic inheritance. Mm -hmm. People f tend to forget that it's our environment, whether it be you know mold exposure, major stress, uh, major chemical exposures. These things can have such a significant impact on our health. So I see lots of thyroid disruption. I see borderline insulin resistance mm. with high um, chemical exposure. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I can also see, unfortunately, reproductive outcomes like pregnancy loss and. Um, so many causes for recurrent pregnancy loss, right. but we have to take the environment into account.